please turn off your mobile phones. Hello, yeah. Oh, that's me. Okay, okay. Uh, let me introduce you Michael Mix. And his talk is LibreOffice turns 10 and what's next? Please, after uh, Michael finished his presentation, uh, don't run away and wait until uh, question session end. Thank you. Michael. Thank you very much. Excellent. So, you know, I'd love to encourage you to all move closer and enjoy the, the proximity of, of being next to each other in this, this lovely auditorium, but perhaps not this time. Anyway. Um, so, so this is what I'm going to talk about, so I won't uh, tell you about that. Um, here we go. So, 10 years, 10 years, or 20 years. Amusingly, uh, LibreOffice has been uh, growing in, in conjunction with FOSDEM for 20 years, and so we're very just thrilled to be able to celebrate our 10th or 20th, depending how you look at it, or, or 35th anniversary uh, at the same time that FOSDEM is, so uh, just fantastic. And... Um, yeah, was it, I'm sorry, 45, 35? It's a long time, 1985. Yeah, 35 years. Um, so Marco Burius, a wonderful guy, a teenager working in his garage. You have to be careful about garages. You know, don't go in. You may come out with uh, an office suite, you know. Um, so, so he releases this, and at this stage, in, in um, uh, this, this time, it's really just a word processor, a star writer. But it gets the dibs, you know. It beats Microsoft Office by, you know, nearly five years. So that's, so that's all good. This is the 93 version, and uh, just a word processor. And, and you need to understand the world at this time. Um, uh, all sorts of interesting things were happening. Uh, so a, a spreadsheet was created, which was called Quattro Pro. I don't know if you know why. Um, but Lotus created something called One, Two, Three. And so Borland created something called Four, um, which was, you know, it was a friendly time. Um, and we lived in a diverse industry, not dominated by one monopoly, uh, which was fantastic. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, Lotus was suing Borland about the structure, sequence, and organization of uh, menus. So, you know, no nothing like today, obviously. Um, and, and anyway, so these are some great quotes from Philip Kahn, the Borland uh, co-founder, you know, prehistoric, anything 20 years old and over. I don't know if any of you are over 20, but uh, I am. And uh, it's, good to, it's good to know that the facelift isn't going to do it, you know. Um, but, but Philippe was particularly interested uh, and a good exemplar of the, the excitement at the time about revolutionary programming language change, you know. Uh, object orientation would make everything wonderful. Uh, everything would be ten times quicker and, and more beautiful. Um, you know, we would develop so amazingly rapidly. Uh, software would become easy to read, easy to, to handle. Um, it was absolutely amazing. And Philippe um, told so many people this. You even get the New York Times uh, explaining, um, you know, this, this radical new uh, innovation, you know, so here are some great, great quotes from him. Um, creating the initial objects is, is difficult, uh, especially for programmers, uh, and so, you know, you can see some of the Pascal programmers that came into OpenOffice in the time, or Star Office, and, and did the one big class approach, you know? Yeah, sure, it's object-orientated, why not? Well, one class with a thousand methods that does, does everything. But ultimately, the payoff will be faster, less costly development, of new programs and updates. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Gates has an interesting c quote in the same article. If it's so great, why are their products so late? And I think that's, uh, that's a really great question. Um, careful of panaceas. Anyway, back at this time, Marco is, is, is I guess, uh, in, in this era of excitement around object-oriented programming. And so he creates a visual class library. It's a new way of creating toolkits that will make applications trivial to write. Um, and so... Well, he tries to sell this toolkit, but the demo apps, it turns out, are the thing that most interests people. You know, he creates this, these office apps. And, and, and actually, in the end, he then ends up refactoring uh, and creating these, these uh, office productivity suite out of his, uh, his visual class library project, which is brilliant. I think these days they call this a pivot. Um, you know, there's a posh term for it, but uh, absolutely brilliant. So uh, he, he went back to the, the office business. He created Star Office 3, which completely rewrote this. So he even ran on OS 2, which is fantastic, and Spark. And yeah, directly competed with Windows uh, and Office 95, as it were. And this is the code we're built on today. It's, uh, it's still the skeleton of, of that, uh, some of that design. And why is that interesting? Well, <clears throat> it turns out that object orientation is not a panacea. 
<clears throat> and it's, it's a different way of arranging your code and your data, and that's good. You know, there are many benefits to it. But the problem is when you sit down and you design your object hierarchy based on what you see, you don't necessarily get a very good design. So you see cells in spreadsheets, so well, that has to be an object. Everything I can see should have an object, you know? Yeah, yeah that's, that's not necessarily a good idea. You know, small talk popularized this approach, I guess. You know, every integer should be an object. Um, but, well, anyway. Um, say so paragraphs, tables should be objects. Um, the problem is that this really screws up change tracking. Um, so, so it was really very well understood how to create good office suites uh, back in the day when these decisions were made, and almost none of these uh, insights were taken into account. Another cool thing about object orientation, of course, is, is encapsulation of information. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if your file format just serialized all these objects and they stored their internal state and all would be well? Oh, dear. Well, roll on 20 years, and some of those initial object hierarchy decisions turn out not to have been the best ones. And the problem is, when your file format is essentially a serialization of your object hierarchy, uh, you have a real problem. So, so what was done was copying and pasting the whole office suite at the point that it could generate XML files into a duplicate office suite, which we called the bin filter. And this kept the old object hierarchy, uh, loaded your file, saved it as, a, as, as ODF, reloaded it as ODF into the main uh, office suite. And we finally managed to get rid of this, you know, like uh, five years ago, uh, which, is, which is quite good going. And this then freed us up to you know, undo some of these, these stupid things. So spreadsheets, for example, we, you know, massive refactorings of the core there, totally restructured the data. A cell is not an object. It's, it's a set of you know, complex uh, data structures that describe styles and formatting. And, um, uh, you know, and if it's got a number in it, if you have a column full of doubles, it is at root a contiguous span of doubles. If you want to sum them, you can do SSE optimized sum. You can parallelize this. You can deal with the data in a meaningful way. And um, that's simply not pos possible with the object approach. Um, and similarly, writer, you know, the, the problems of trying to do change tracking with tables and all of these different objects, it, just incredibly problematic, in incredibly problematic. And so uh, Michael Stahl for TIB has been doing some great, great work there that's shipping now to, to try and turn this into a view state. So previously, when you pressed a, when you pressed a key, um, it would actually mutate the model to what it thought it should be, and then put the key in and then mutate it again um, so, so if you weren't showing change tracking, it would actually literally edit all of your redlining in and out of the document, every keystroke, which is kind of uncool. Um, anyway, so, so open office. So how did this happen? Well, um, this is the heady days of floss being the panacea. You know, open source will fix everything. It's uh, fantastic. And I, I'm, I'm a big free software lover myself. So, uh, you know, I, uh, but, you know, I think Larry Ellison says, you know, open source is going to kill proprietary software. You know, um, uh, you know the, the mini computer will kill the mainframe. You know, Larry, who is not a man I approve of generally, but, but he says, you know, he's been in this industry a long time, and, and watching the mainframe die is like watching a glacier melt. You know, even with uh, global warming, it's, it's going slowly. You know, they're still, still there. Anyway, but so, so you know, floss, our mission uh, is to drive floss and make it uh, rule the world, but uh, we need to think about, about ways to speed that up. So... Yeah, so, so anyway, Sun by Star Division, for less than the cost of the licenses it was paying, are, are, are reputedly. And uh, Marco is then a VP of whatever, and he open sources Star Office, which is absolutely fantastic. And uh, a really good, a good thing to do. I mean, so he did this talking to Miguel and Nat, who were doing a lot of GNOME stuff at Zimian, uh, working on evolution, uh, mail client stuff. And so actually, there was some kind of compromise whereby GNOME kind of de emphasized its Office suite, and they got rid of their mail clients, and life was happy. We all work together in a glorious, glorious new world. Unfortunately, in terms of attracting developers, um, the guy who wrote the build instructions for OpenOffice was a non-developer who apparently hadn't done the job. Um, you know, he just cargo culted some rumors he'd heard from, from here and there. And when they came to attracting developers, you know, the, the, the goal of a dependency graph of OpenOffice was to terrify you uh, rather than to try and teach you anything, it seems, you know. Um, so, actually, it's not really that difficult, you know. I mean, like, get this complexity. There's 8 million lines of code. But it's not, it's not the madness that you can try and make it look like if you really, if you really go for it. Another fun thing about OpenOffice was the development process. So, so, inside the team of, you know, I don't know, 50, 100 developers, there was a great development methodology, which was this. Um, you could do something fun, you know, in your base library. 
Uh, you could rename a method for no apparent reason, or, 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 or change the order of parameters, or, or, or something like that. And then you would simply send an email to all of your colleagues saying, well, I did this. Uh, please go and fix your code. Um, before moving on to doing another similar you know, uh, thing. And, and, and the, the problem with this, of course, is that you know, the, the code never actually builds. Of course, you commit your code as well, right? So your, your code goes in, your, your, but, and everyone else has to, um, to, to try and catch up. And um, yeah, unfortunately, platform and API churn rapidly overwhelms the ability of any, anyone to do actually anything up here, because it's all uh, breaking uh, down there. And yes, of course, there's a panacea to fix that. Just rewrite it all in another language, and then, you know. Um, so, so the build tree was in a permanent state of brokenness. Um, and so they had release engineers whose job was effectively to branch the tree every two weeks or as soon as they could actually build it. It usually took that sort of time. And, and then they would try and include all the fixes that would actually make it build. And at the end of this, they would do you know, many a day or two of building on CPU time. And then they'd give everyone binaries that they could build on top of for their next uh, extravaganza of, of API change and, uh, and improvement. Um, so, so one of the corollaries of this is the top commit count people in the world, if you look in Olo, are the release engineers that merged everyone else's patches. They, they, they're just, you know, they're just outstanding. Um, so, so, so just to, to reflect on this, this sounds like a ridiculous situation where the people who maintain the platform can rabidly change it and break everyone that works on top of it. That's a mad way to develop software, isn't it? Well, welcome to Linux. Fantastic. You know, everybody in the base system has brilliant ideas for improving uh, things at the bottom. Um, and the great news is that everybody that builds on top of them gets to live with this. And, uh, you know, uh, so let me encourage you to keep your APIs stable and your ABIs stable and to, to live with the pain. Um, because although removing the threaded, the option of having threaded users of your toolkit seems like a nice cleanup that removes 20 or 30 lines out of GTK, just to pick an example, um, it totally screws LibreOffice and everyone that ever wrote a macro, potentially. So, you know, it might be nice to see the... Hello. See the suffering you inflict on others before you, uh, you know, uh, do it, I guess. Uh, so anyway, it took me a month to get my first build. I'm obviously an idiot. Um, but um, with, with a whole load of fixes, which I quickly upstreamed, I managed to get it to build. And, you know, I, you could then update it, and then it would break again completely uh, for weeks. And there was never anything that you could actually be sure would actually work. So I created this thing called OO Build, and based on Frederick Crozat's work, and suddenly... All the Linux distributions used it. Fantastic. Um, and the good news was that, you know, a day into your build of, of wall clock time, it was at least not intended to fail. You know, like, like it were, at least someone else had built it and thought it should work, um, which is kind of, kind of good. You know, <clears throat> build times have improved, but we're still, at, you know, an hour, a minimum. And so there were some serious strains there. I mean, at the time, I visited a, a conference in the UK, and everywhere I went, I found frustration. Uh, you know, there were people with holding up uh, placards like this. Uh, you know, don't mandate incredibly burdensome process just to fix uh, simple, simple things. Uh, don't force people to have a, a team that they have to join with a, a product owner and a spec writer and a UX designer and a QA person. Blah, blah, blah. Why not just, you know, uh, let things actually uh, carry on? <clears throat> um, try and avoid the uh, bugs, uh, you know, piling up and... Uh, Yes, actually fix some would be, would be, be nice. Um, contributor agreements. Well, when do you think Fedora dropped the requirement for a contributor agreement that assigned copyright to a, a wonderful company, uh, Red Hat, right? Um, so, you know, don't, don't keep people out of the project uh, when you, we don't need to. Um, it's very difficult if you're the majority contributor, not, you know, to, to include other words. But uh, LibreOffice, of course, you know, I uh, tried, tried to fix this. And then there's just the cultural problems, you know? I don't know if you know people who are like this, you know? Every solution has a problem. Uh, that means you can't even think of doing it. And uh, it gets a bit much after a while. And, and, and yeah, I don't want to mischaracterize the, the start of vision. There, there were really, you know, many of these burdensome process things were not just for the community. They were just like corporate culture projected outside. And there were some real heroes there that went, so tried to make the community a fun place to be by doing the burdensome process themselves. 
and they're just absolutely fantastic. So, uh, you know, the, but there was serious cultural uh, problems here. Uh, so, LibreOffice, well, here we go. So during the LibreOffice conference uh, in, in Budapest, uh, the OpenOffice conference, uh, we, we managed to bundle everyone else in the conference off on a boat on the river. And had you been on the boat, you would have noticed that these people weren't there. They were at a separate restaurant, uh, plotting. Uh, in, and so by September the 2nd, uh, we'd come up with a plan uh, and, and had a nice meal to, to boot. Um, and interestingly, almost all of these people are still involved in the project today, which is fantastic. Some of them are full-time staff, or almost all of them are still doing wonderful things. Which I think is a testament to how, how fun uh, this can be. Um, but yeah, so, so we, had a, we, had a good, we had a good time there. And uh, in less than a month, we would have released uh, LibreOffice. And of course, um, at this point, you need to call in all your favors when you're starting a, a new risky, a risky project. Uh, there are a lot of people that you've met at FOSDEM and elsewhere and programmed with that you have to go and uh, encourage to uh, do something risky. Um, so, so this was the, the management stack in Red Hat, and this was SUSE, and these are two main external contributors uh, to OpenOffice. Uh, and here's one of the, I will uh, I anonymize the company that was having, having uh, problems because frankly, both of them were, you know. It was really much after you, no, no, after you, you know, this sort of thing. Is this going to be a success? How can we tell when I'm, I'm, when I'm you know, th this guy at the top? Uh, and, and to be fair, these, these are really cool guys. You'll never have, well, maybe you've not heard of many of these people. Probably, uh, probably you should do. Um, but, you know, the, the problem was that we'll do it if Google does. We, we, you know, we, we'll, we, we want something to, uh, you, know, to back. So we, you know, we had PR agencies lined up, corporate backing, you know, and then Red Hat and SUSE, you know, backed, backed this extraordinarily uh, helpfully. So 10 days to launch, I sent an email like this um, uh, to, to Chris, Chris DeBoner and uh, Jeremy Allison, who's, who's, who's here, which is cool, at, at Google, saying, you know, <laughs> quick, we, we need help. Uh, please, can you give us a double rainy, ra rainbows and ponies, uh, you know, uh, Sort of thing, or just any kind of vague commitment that we can use to, uh, to bounce this along. Uh, the, the bit that perhaps you missed here is that much of the plotting was done entirely without any, any backup, and then you go and ask for it, uh, you know, when it's all on the edge, of course, something real happening there. Well, 10 days to launch. I think this is a good sign, you know? <laughs> um, uh, so, yes, seven days before launch, uh, they, they come up trumps, you know? So, uh, so uh, yeah, Google is proud to be a supporter of the Document Foundation, which doesn't exist yet, and is run by a whole load of kids, right? You know, and participate in the project. You know, a resounding, a resounding endorsement. Uh, bingo, unlocked everything. So, in terms of uh, getting people to to line up and sign up, um, this is this is uh, just absolutely wonderful. And so, so you know, I I think, yeah, Google played perhaps an unsung but uh, extraordinarily helpful. A process of getting everybody on side, uh, of doing that some kind of due diligence over a beer, you know, in a, in a community room uh, uh, somewhere, and making it making it fly. So yeah, then we didn't have a logo. Well, so Christoph Nowak is, uh, is an awesome guy who was one of the uh, early uh, plotters, as you can see, and uh, we were playing around uh, with lots of different uh, logos. Um, my, my friend Larry Ewing uh, created Tux, actually, a, a programmer. Um, not really a, a designer, he drew the Tux logo. And then he wanted to draw the Zimian logo after we'd spent a fortune on outsourced design agencies to try and make a logo, all of which sucked. And he's like, oh, I just, you know, like, the anyway. So it turns out, uh, Christoph created this. Yeah, help me improve it. I'm not experienced in graphics design, you know? I know some, but actually, if you look at Wikipedia and you look at the logo article, I think someone's got a sense of humor there. This is the example of the minimalist logo, and IBM is next to it. And, uh, you know, what, what can you do? Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool and, and visually distinct brand. And then, of course, you know, we needed builds. So everyone's panically creating builds, uh, synchronizing them to our mirror brain network so we can cope with the download uh, bandwidth. So uh, Peter Pummel created that and was involved with this. Getting the infrastructure set up, the Git repository with a website in it late at night, craziness, blah, blah, blah. Bingo. The 28th. Here it is. And so we have, you know, Viva Liberal Office, you know, Novell, Red Hat, and lots of other people then come in. You know, Richard Stallman and Mark Shuttleworth. The OSI, Simon, is, of course, still involved with uh, LibreOffice, GNOME, Neo Office, BR Office. Um, BR Office is interesting because it shared, uh, it had a powerful brand in, in Latin America, and all of those guys could move across uh, straight away to, to us. And so our very first release looked like that. And hopefully you can see some degree of brand continuity, let's say, uh, from, from, from the initial, uh, initial release. 
So, so then there was a whole load of work, you know, like, it was amazing. Lo loads of people arrived. And actually, be before I talk about that, I just want to talk about how we structured the community. So my experience of working in free software has not been, uh, prior to LibreOffice, has not been one free of conflict, let's say. Um, it, was, it was routinely my experience that, that not only would there be four or five duplicate approaches to anything, say, window managers and GNOME, you know, like, the, the, written in every conceivable language, Lisp, C++, Haskell, whatever. Um, but they would actually fight each other quite viciously for, for, for user share, mind share, market share. And, th and they would not talk to each other either. They would certainly not tell them what they were going to do in the future. You know, I mean, disclose any, anything. And so, so actually, it's like cats fighting in a bag almost, almost everywhere. And, and, and this is pretty depressing. And it, it sometimes got personal. You know, oh, don't talk to him. He's the bad guy. Oh, yeah, you want to watch. And, and all these coalitions would be built. And then the mailing list would arrive, and they'd fight tooth and nail on the mailing list as well. I, I, I speak from experience as one who used to fight tooth and nail on mailing list. Anyway, if you, if you read all of the literature on conflict resolution, using email to resolve conflicts is a reliable way of making everything worse. Okay? Like, this is, this is kind of uh, easy. You know, this is, they tell you something like this the first day in HR. And, yeah... So, so it's absolutely ridiculous. And of course, giving control and ownership and like this maintainership where you own something and it can be taken from you and you, you know, you've got to fight to hold on to it and so on. Ah, dear. It was absolute nonsense. So we, from the very beginning, had uh, phone calls uh, for the Engineering Steering Committee in whom everyone was peers. They were all the right people, all the people doing the work. Um, of course, if you have a respected expert in calc and someone who works somewhere totally different telling them what to do, Everyone's going to give them a pretty hard stare, right? Like, I mean, you, you need to respect experts. But, yeah, uh, no one owns, owns modules. But, of course, this is a bit of a problem for people that don't speak English like I do. And uh, so, so what we do is we transcribe, live transcribe the meeting. So as people speak, it's written down so everyone can follow and uh, get involved. And so in at least the technical sphere, there have been, as far as I'm aware, no instances of conflict no significant duplications of anything, and everybody has worked uh, reasonably happily together. So, yeah, it's, it's just a blissful experience, LibreOffice. If you want to work in a project where it's fun and there's not massive conflict, uh, come and see us. Anyway, so what do we do? Well, GNU Make, we made the, make, the build system easy to use. Uh, we fixed a whole load of coverity defects. Uh, we did systematic crash load testing. Interestingly, we were always told that we were the dirty hackers that, that didn't know what they were doing, and they were the professional developers with our I teams and you know process and so on. Um, but you know, we just just fixed so much junk in the uh, in the code base over time. Um, it's even fully translated now. The code base um, unit testing from not existing at all to you know starting to be you know quite significant. Automated performance regression testing running in Valgrind. This is this is a uh, cache grind is a wonderful tool um, and it's wonderful for one reason, which is that over over years of, of development where nothing changed, this line is flat, completely flat. There's no jitter, so you can see from can commit to commit, you didn't cause a regression, even a small one. Uh, proper crash reporting, fixing that. Code quality improvement, we threw every tool at it we could find, pretty much, and uh, people were willing to fund. Probably the best is OSS Fuzz, uh, Google's uh, thing there using AFL and Clang, but just lots of other stuff. And what you discover is that as soon as you introduce a new tool, okay, Verity, say, there's a massive burst of fixing, and then it tails off. And, and so you think, oh, we're brilliant, we've fixed everything. And then you introduce another one, it finds a different set of problems, and we fix those. So, so here's the active commit account. Um, so it's a, it's a bit dodgy before uh, we use Git, um, but you can see various historic things here. So Sun, Sun was bought by Oracle at this point. So you can see uh, the, the, the things happen there. Uh, SUSE decides to exit uh, a LibreOffice and does it beautifully cleanly. And you can see it tapers slightly, but they, they then spin out Calabra and put some staff in there and some funding to, to create the company I, I run, which is great. Uh, SIB comes out of SUSE a bit and starts to do some stuff this Screen line, uh, you can see, uh, yeah, um, so you can see all sorts of things there. And you can also see Oracle disappearing. Bingo, suddenly gone. Um, and you can also see the magnitude, you know, that we, we managed to recover the project and keep it alive uh, despite the, uh, the, the sudden loss of staff. Uh, native languages, yeah, like 145 used languages, 4,500 plus users doing translation. Fantastic work there. Thank you for all uh, who do that. And of course, we would regularly meet up. FOSDEM was, uh, yeah, just wonderful. You know, FOSDEM, you know, the support of the open source community made this 
make this fun, you know? It was nice to come and talk and tell you the stories of what we were doing, uh, give you USB keys with the code on it, help you get started, get people's first hacks done, you know, plug the thing into the laptop, transfer it, get their first commit in, and so on. At some stage, I went around collecting scalps. Leonard Pottering has a commit in it, you know. Uh, Greg KH, you know, like we, have, we have a number of, number of people who, who uh, you know, so, so come and see me if you want to get your first, first commit in, we'll find something, uh, something for you. Um, and of course, you know, conferences are all over the place. Uh, you know, the, the first one, we were not good at taking pictures, as you can see, uh, but we got better and better and, uh, you know, lots and lots of people over the years uh, working on this. Suzicon is next. Oh, it works again. Fantastic. Ah, excellent. And then um, I'm just going to uh, flick through these. Uh, I'm going to flick through these very, very quickly. Um, Aha, VBA, yes. Um, so I'm going to flick through these quickly, and I'm not going to tell you anything about them, because the purpose of these features is not the features. But anyway, a GStreamo auto shapes, making smart art work nicely, ranges on text comments, massive RTF improvements, DocX annotation, CMIS integration, XML importing, conditional formatting, icons, everything, stock option pricing, Android remotes, beautiful Android remotes, iOS remote controls, Libra logo for education, improved image scaling, uh, all sorts of left-to-right fixes for our, uh, Arabic and uh, Israeli friends. Um, templates, prettier previews, widget layout so you can dynamically size and adapt for language and make the UI look pretty. Uh, reworking every user interface dialog, all you know, 800, 900, 700 of them plus, uh, to use a proper layout language. And native platform widgets using the toolkit, CSS animations, beautiful stuff, Unity integration, you can name three integration, personas to make it pretty, new trend lines, character borders, Cipher, you know, new icon themes everywhere, start screens making it look pretty, Windows integration, you know, policy management, group management, lockdown, a firebird so you can rid ourselves of the last Java pieces, uh, ultra fast calculation using your hardware, prettier branding, selling t-shirts everywhere, uh, formula wizards, you can, you can go to our booth, I'm sure, and, uh, and, and get one of these, a multi-threading support, actually using the rest of your hardware that's not used, improved statistics, better impress, a sidebar, you know, prettification, and so on, uh, better transitions, much better impress uh, view, uh, 3D transitions of all kinds of beautiful things, um, Yes, uh, we even have some bugs as well, so, you know. Uh, but getting the high priority regressions down to almost, almost nothing and getting our regressions flat. Um, liberating your documents. So, in, you know, ODF obviously helps you liberate your documents if you can already load them and transfer to that. Uh, but, you know, there's all these old people, WordPro, WordPerfect, Abbey Word, Keynote, uh, the next Keynote format. Apple keeps changing its formats in incompatible, undocumented ways. Uh, Visio. Uh, you know, more better Visio, Microsoft Publisher, uh, absolutely loads of these things out there, right? I mean, I, I gave up in 2016. Oh, cloud stuff. Um, so connecting to cloud things, Alfresco integration, eGroupware integration for our online uh, version of, of LibreOffice, uh, Colab, Nextcloud, OwnCloud, Pydeo, Ruv, Mattermost. Well, so why do I show you all these things? Because all of these things represent years, man decades, tens of man decades of work, okay? 20s of man, 30s of man decades of work. And one of the problems we have as engineers is that we think if we make the software better, uh, they will come, you know? Uh, if you build a better mousetrap, people will buy it. And I still believe that, you know? If you, if you look at how I invest my own personal money, you know, it's in software development. My time is, is in software development. But actually, here's the tragedy. It took five years so most of the features I just showed you there were already in LibreOffice, and yet still more people were downloading something that fundamentally hasn't changed in any, any feature function way since it was launched. So this is the open office uh, trend line, right? And I, I, Google cannot lie. You know? This is, uh, this is uh, hard data from, from you know, loads and loads of searches. And so Actually, all that branding that we built in the first 10 years of OpenOffice took a huge amount of effort to turn into you know, something positive and open and uh, you know, community-driven and so on that, that actually works and, and get our brands to the point where people can see it. And that's a little bit concerning. It's a bit concerning. Um, and, and we still have 250,000 downloads a week of something that is a museum of, of office productivity. Um, which is a great shame. It's disappointing users. I mean, it's fair enough to, to have museums. I mean, I, it's good. It's good. You know, I mean, I, I love to visit them. It's, it's interesting. But it disappoints users. 
and it, it gives them a bad image of uh, what free software can do and the dynamism and excitement uh, that's possible there. And so I think there's two things there. This is pretty shameful, and it should be fixed, and we've tried really hard to do that. But, but also that the brand is really important. Branding really matters. The equity you're putting into that name you know, and I still, my friends still say open office by mistake from time to time. It's one of these cognitive slips that, you know, that just sort of happens. Um, and it's, it's a shame. So it's, it's very easy to think it's about the code, about the features. But actually, branding, trademark, ecosystem, investment are almost more important. Uh, I, it's, it's sad to say it, but economics drives almost everything. So you can see the graph here of commits. Companies are doing nearly three quarters of the commits in LibreOffice, and they're awesome. We love all of our ecosystem. But, yeah, that's pretty frightening. They're, of course, mentoring much of the rest of the quarter as well, right? So, how do you do that? And one of the problems is that LibreOffice has a brand, and that brand drives people to a nonprofit a foundation, which is, which is wonderful. But how can you then encourage people to invest in that? How can you give them a stake in that and a, a viable business? Uh, currently, something like 0.12% of people that hit the LibreOffice webpage even discover there are professional services around it. Okay, so almost all of them uh, donate something and download, which is, which is great. Um, but, yeah, how can you build that thriving ecosystem such that this, this graph begins to be slightly similar to this graph? <laughs> or at least a closer. And as you see, we're making progress. I think it's gone up from 0.05% to 0.12% in the last year. So there you go. Anyway, people are downloading it. The good news is we have, you know, I don't know, a million, 800,000 uh, downloads a week, which is, which is encouraging, uh, and certainly you know, in the right ballpark, and going upwards, uh, which we like, although heavily seasonal, and, and of course, interestingly, I mean, it's a business product that people use, so they, at the weekend it drops off, and at Christmas. Um, yeah, donations seem to be going in the right direction, um, and, and one, this is a huge strength. We're just so grateful to our 64,000 donors who each gave, you know, eight bucks each or whatever, uh, to help us run uh, the foundation, or 12, 12 bucks each, or whatever it is. Um, that's, that's really cool, absolutely cool. So, here we are, I'm supposed to invade on the future, and this is the very risky part, uh, you know, who, who knows? Um, my, I'm convinced the future is a rocket ship, you know, so, so there we go. Um, but, but who can predict the future? Here, so, so you can listen to your users and see what they want. Here's a, here's a selection. Everything is going to move to the web and go online. Everything else will be uh, totally, totally ignored. It's all be in the browser. The next quote's from the same person. Oh, it's just so cool. I can download the app and run it natively on my Chromebook. Uh, I wish we could fix the bugs in that. You're like, really? Interesting. And these are not, this is a strategy, you know, strategy. Uh, people are sensible. I respect their view, right? Um, I want to collaborate on my mobile phone, you know? So phones are obviously the future. Um, I want to be able to load and edit docs offline. You know, um, I want to be able to use the in-network when there is no network. You know, all this, all those sort of other things. Um, it seems clear to me that the, the obvious solution is um, is to create a, uh, an artificial intelligence of stunning subtlety and you know conversational brilliance that can see what we should be doing at every point. Uh, so, if you'd like to help join us and uh, and, and do that, that's uh, that's that's great. Um, the other great way I have of predicting the future is, is telling you what's already done and just pending release. So, so there's a whole load of cool stuff in, in Collabor Online. It allows collaborative editing of documents uh, on your premise. You own it. Digital sovereignty. Uh, no control to anyone else. So nice sidebar stuff coming here on the right uh, to make the UI richer. Uh, things that no one else does. Uh, transitions, animations, and so on. Uh, well, um, just, just, you know, prettiness coming. Um, editing master pages for your presentation online. You know, I don't think anyone else does this. It's, it's too advanced a feature. Uh, managing conditional formats, uh, rich dialogues to do that, Pr prettier UI, uh, formula wizards, uh, you know, just cool color correcting your images in your, in your documents and so on. Uh, better handles for resizing, uh, for spreadsheet stuff, for uh, uh, URL pop-ups, and so on. And of course, the mobile, uh, mobile version too has had a completely new uh, one-handed uh, UI rework. So this is... Um, you can download this as Collaborer online mobile beta, and it's improving very rapidly. Um, it looks familiar to people, I hope. Uh, but again, you can do cool things in there you can't do. Actually, we're just taking the sidebar and wrapping this and re redoing that as native JavaScript widgets. Um, so you can, uh, you can get lots of uh, cool functionality there. Um, iOS versions for, for tablets, and of course, they work on Android too. 
Um, so, so that's, I think, partly the future. Um, more mobile, more online, more, more richness, but all reusing that same core code base uh, that's got you know, 35 years of awesome work underneath it, underpinning that, uh, and you know, some really good functionality. So we'd love people to get involved. We have easy hacks. Um, we've paid a lot of technical debt down, but there's lots more to do. Uh, if you love JavaScript, after you've seen your doctor, uh, you can come, come and help us. You know, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a challenging and exciting language. Uh, but we have plenty of JavaScript that needs, needs uh, doing. Uh, C++, UX design, there's all sorts of things. Whatever your skills are, we would love to work with you. Come and talk to me. Um, user experience, I think, is one of the things that we really need to be working on more. Uh, it's one of those never quite done things. But there are still loads of paper cuts there. There is a UX team that meet. They have things they'd love to do. They're specified. They have lush artwork for it. But they just need a couple of programmers to help them do the simple typing uh, to, to make this work. And then, of course, when you change the UI, the documentation needs updating. So I think I'm almost in time. So I think that's pretty much the story of uh, LibreOffice, OpenOffice, maybe a bit about StarOffice. At the StarOffice times, I was not there. You know, I, I, I'm afraid I, I only joined at the very end of StarOffice and talked to the OpenOffice people so I could be there at the launch and help this, uh, this GNOME uh, open office compromise. But we did what we had to, uh, to make the code base survive. Um, yeah, and just the sheer number of people that did things there is way exceeds my ability to write all their names down in the taxi while I was coming here, um, which is when I finished much of the slides. Um, but, but thank you, thank you for all of the work uh, from those people are there. I think a key, a key thing is that our digital sovereignty is really important. Um, you know, if you look at China, China collects your data in order to control you uh, and to oppress you, probably, or, or to maintain social stability uh, with, them, with, the, with the right people at the top, uh, is perhaps a positive construction. Um, uh, America, of course, uh, gathers your data to sell you things. Uh, so, you know, a different, uh, different, different way of looking at data. And, of course, the European Union has a chance to part, you know, have a different path uh, where we, you know, we help drive and teach the world about the importance of guarding your and controlling your, not only your software, but also your data, keeping it on your premise, uh, controlling it yourself, and, and we really enable that. You know, and, I, and I am excited. It's, it's not just us. Of course, we do the office collaborative piece, but I've, I've shown you some of the integrations we have, the partners. There are, there are great, great tools and products. Let me encourage you to work on those and help uh, move people towards protecting their, themselves, their sovereignty, and arguably their society in the long run. So we need your help. Come and help us make it better. It's some challenging, fulfilling work. I, I love it. I'm still doing it, uh, you know, uh, 10, 10 years in, 20 years in. And it's, it's, it's cool. Um, really, we'd love to, to have that. And beyond that, we rely on your support. You know, maybe you never contributed anything to LibreOffice, but we, we love the fact that you tell your friends about it, uh, that you help us with our branding problem, uh, that you, you, you keep us alive and you, you turn up and listen to this sort of nonsense. So thank you. Thank you for your support. It's greatly appreciated. And yeah, and you've been very good, you know. So if we can have a few questions, I think we have, you have plenty of time to get to the next talk. That is the first thing to say. I have finished ridiculously early. There's 20 minutes, you know, and then something else will happen. So you can rest and relax. Okay, and we sleep. have a question, Michael. Uh, or, or ask questions. You know, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Oh, I'll get some water. Now. Well, thanks, Michael, for a great talk. I would like to hear maybe a little bit more about the certification. Are uh, the Document Foundation happy with the current state of the certification? Would you like to see more certifications exam and maybe partner up with Linux Professional Institute so you can take them both together? I don't know. Cool. So I think we discovered earlier the acoustics are not wonderful in here for questions, but I think you said you want more certification and Linux Professional Institute uh, certification exams and so on. We'd love that. Anyone that can help uh, contribute is good. Our certification currently is primarily focused on professionals to help grow our ecosystem and get more companies and individuals to contribute to and improve the project. Um, so end user certification is not what we're doing, really. Um, but we'd love other people to do that. Talk to Italo. He's here, and he runs, or, or Lofa Becker. He's here. Go to a booth and, and chat to them. If you have good ideas and you can help, we love it. Good, good idea. Sir. Uh, hi, I'm Alex. First, many thanks for, for, for the LibreOffice suit. 
Like it's great. Uh, I'm still like I have uh, two questions. One, uh, the first one is, uh, do you uh, um, still have uh, um, uh, tr trouble with the uh, uh, lack of documentation for Microsoft's format, like the, the new one, the, the newer ones, and their supportability? Uh, that's uh, uh, the first thing. And the second thing is. Uh, uh, who, what do you see as your like, uh, greatest uh, competition? Is, like, is it like uh, still Microsoft Office or uh, the, the Google uh, Documents uh, uh, ecosystem? Or is uh, that an opportunity to grow? Yeah, so good, two good questions. The first was about OpenXML and documentation and interoperability. So I think, I think our interoperability is outstanding and improving. Um, I don't think there's any other code base that does as well as we do in terms of allowing you to view and understand and edit those documents. Um, you know, look, these are very old code bases. I, Microsoft calls its source code legacy rich. Uh, and I, I think that's a positive framing. Um, the documentation is pretty good. It's usually not the documentation that's the problem. It's the time spent to implement the feature. Because it's no good. If you don't have the feature, you can't interoperate terribly easily. Uh, so that was that. And then in terms of your other question, which was uh, competition. Oh, who's our competition? Well, I hope people are aware of uh, who, who are, who's out there uh, producing uh, software. But um, I think, you know, clearly Microsoft is, is, a, is the big beast in the room, you know, in terms of the, the desktop product. Um, in terms of the online product, um, I think, you know, there are all sorts of market niches. You know, digital sovereignty is a great niche to be in. People who care about having their data under control, you know, lawyers, professional, uh, you know, professionals in all sorts of spheres, medicine and so on. You don't, don't want to be handing out your data to someone, uh, someone else. Uh, so, I, so I think there's some great niches there. And yeah, obviously, we compete with everyone that makes an office suite. Um, but you know, I'm excited about what's going on. So. Uh, hi. Do you, sorry. <laughs> mm. uh, do you ever work with uh, the developers of OpenOffice or NeoOffice? Do you talk with them or collaborate? So they're, they're friends way? of mine. Uh, well, to, to some degree. Like the, the NeoOffice people, I think, still exist. I, I, I don't. I haven't talked to Patrick and Ed uh, for a long time. Um, but our Mac, Mac builds are now pretty capable, uh, you know, so, so, so they're cool. And yeah, of course, we talk to the open office people to try and resolve the, uh, you know, uh, the divide uh, whenever we can. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, what, what can you do? You know, I, I think there are all sorts of really positive stories we can tell if we can encourage the users to use something that's better. So yeah, I mean, like, th this. So come and see me if, you, if you're involved with Apache and have good ideas. Good question. One more? Two more? Any questions so far? Da -na, da -na. You? Anything at all? Well, in which case, you've been extremely good and well-behaved. Thank you so much. Have a great day.